We're starting a new series this morning. It's called There Is an I in Worship. You probably have heard the expression, there is no I in team. And uh, somebody said that to Michael Jordan one time. And he said, yeah, but there is an I in win. And so <laughs> if you know Michael Jordan, you're not surprised he said that. The reason for the series is that often we feel disenfranchised or somehow unable to step into something called worship. And so I want to take a few weeks and just look at ways that we can lean into something that God has provided for us as, a, as something that actually benefits us. We often see worship as something that benefits God. And it actually benefits us. That's why he calls us to it. And so we're going to be in John, the fourth chapter. And this is a very familiar passage of scripture. And I'm not going to read the entire exchange between Jesus and a woman who is a Samaritan and they're at a well in Samaria. Uh, I'm just going to focus on the, the second part of their conversation. And beginning in verse 19, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Think about that. The Father is seeking worshipers. God is a spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Uh, usually this passage is actually used to focus on evangelism. How do you start a conversation or engage a conversation with someone who has very different views about God or about faith or uh, about human purpose in life? But there is incredibly rich content in this passage that has to do with issues of worship. Earlier in the chapter, in verse 9, we didn't read this particular verse, but in verse 9, it actually says where the, the woman acknowledges that the Jews and the Samaritans have no dealings with each other. They did not get along. And what's interesting is that uh, 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 the Samaritans come from the tribe of uh, Ephraim and the tribe of Manasseh, they were both sons of Joseph. So they were part of the Jewish lineage. And yet when the kingdom was divided north and south, they were in the northern part of the kingdom and that kingdom was taken over by the Assyrians. And one of the things that they did was they tried to drive out any nationalism in anyone that they conquered. And so what they basically did is not just encourage, they almost required you to marry outside of your ethnicity. And so they had done that. And to the Jews, that was considered out of bounds. God called us to be ethnically pure. And so they didn't accept that. But it wasn't just a one-way street. The Samaritans also didn't like the Jews, and that's because that when the, the Jews were taken into exile, into Babylonian captivity, they were there for several hundred years, and when they came back, their worship had, had evolved a little bit, it had morphed a little bit, it had changed somewhat, and they saw this as, as Babylonian influence on worship. So the Jews didn't like the Samaritans because they weren't ethnically pure, and the Samaritans didn't like the Jews because they didn't think their worship was pure. They did not get along. And uh, at the time that Jesus was talking to her, there were over a million Samaritans alive. Actually, in terms of ethno-religious group, they are less than a thousand in the world today. There are only four families that live in the West Bank and in Israel. And uh, they've had uh, a great deal of trouble uh, maintaining this lineage. So Jesus surprises this woman in this conversation 
which had all the potentiality of being contentious because there are two groups who see things very differently. I know it's hard for us to imagine that that could ever happen, but way back in the ancient world, it happened a lot. Our technology has rescued us from all of that. Aren't you glad? Yeah, not so much, has it? Yeah. In some ways, our technology might have made it worse. And, uh, and so she, she brings up, she's been put on the spot about a very personal thing, and she brings up the difference in worship. And, and Jesus, it, he creates a stunning statement. It's, it, it's easy for us to miss it, but we shouldn't. Worship begins with the understanding that God is looking for you. See, we think worship is all about us seeking God. And Jesus starts with, this, with the phrase, the Father is looking for worshipers. Not just people who go through rituals and routines kind of thoughtlessly. Not just people who can check the boxes on the things that if asked, they could pass the test. He's looking for worshipers who will worship in spirit and truth. And, and worship includes this idea that you, you add worth to something or you, you value something very highly. You've probably heard the expression, you know, he worshiped the ground she walks on. That means something. He values that relationship and that person above all others. Like worship is like that. And so worship, when we come to God, it's a recognition. I'm not God. If you're worshiping something else, it means that, that whatever that is, it's greater than you. If you thought you were the greatest, you would ask people to worship you. So it starts out with a recognition. I'm not God. I don't have all the answers. I don't even know all the questions. I'm not God. I didn't create the world. Mostly what I create is a mess in the world that I or other people have to clean up. And worship recognizes that God is greater than I am. Since God is greater, it makes sense that when we go to him, what we ask is not for him to impose our will. Our reason in coming to God in worship is not to get him to do what we want. It's to try to find out what he wants. Because when God gets his way, it's called heaven. That's what Jesus said. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will is always done in heaven. That's why it's heaven. When we get our way, we make a lot of things very, very difficult in our world. So we're tempted to want to impose our will, get God to do what we want, but we're also tempted to try to impose our will on how we worship, how we worship. I, I had a, a, an older gentleman come to me one time. And he said, Pastor, he said, I noticed that sometimes the youth lead the service. And I said, yeah. And he, and he said, and, and they lead the worship. I said, yes, it's wonderful. And he said, I, I noticed that sometimes the kids lead the service. And I said, yes. And he said, and they lead the worship. I said, yes, and it's wonderful. He said, I was wondering if some of us seniors could lead a service and, and, and lead the worship. And I said, that sounds like a really good idea. And he said, I was wondering if we could sing some of the old songs. And I said, that sounds wonderful. And he said, I was wondering if we could sing them the way they're supposed to be sung. <laughs> I go, well, now see, we, just right then, did you feel it? We crossed the line. And uh, we do that, right? That worship somehow becomes... I will engage in what I prefer. And, and worship isn't about our preferences. It, it isn't about our will. It's about God. That's a very different thing. So uh, it's easy to assume that because we know something, we, we know all about worship. And here's what I want you to see. There's two basic preferences in worship, and one is the informational preference, and this is truth. The, the um, uh, people who focus on the truth side. So there are people who focus on the truth, people who focus on the spirit side, 
and on the truth side, the primary source of truth is Scripture. Now, you can learn things about God by studying creation, but Scripture actually holds a condensed uh, information source about his mission and about his interaction with people over time. And so there's a lot more detail that you can find in Scripture. And it's easy to assume that if I know what's in Scripture, that that equals worship. And uh, he, here's the thing is, is knowledge, Paul put it this way, knowledge has a tendency to puff up. If, if you, when, when I was in the hospital, I used a medical term when the doctor came to see me. And, and he said, oh, do you have a medical background? And I said, not at all. I said, I'm just repeating what another doctor said. And I always think that makes me sound smarter. And he thought that was pretty funny. Um, we, we like to feel a little bit superior. And so when we know something, we can. And we can allow pride to take root in our heart because we know something someone else doesn't know. And here's the thing, uh, and this is real important. There are people who believe, and, and you might be among them, that people who are more emotional are more easily deceived than people who are intellectual. And neither scripture nor human history has ever given any evidence that our mind is less susceptible to deception than our heart. We're, we're all susceptible to deception. So, uh, we can like reading truth, we can like hearing truth, but we might struggle with declaring truth and lifting our voice in worship. And uh, we might say, well, you know, look, I know that there are some people, they're, 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 they're kind of the, the extroverts. Uh, my personality and my temperament is more reserved. And, and so I know they're acting out of their natural impulses. I'm acting out of mine. It would, it would be completely unwise to approach worship without truth to guide us. It is equally, equally unwise to assume that our knowledge and our belief is all that's required for worship. Knowing is not the same as doing. So uh, Jesus indicates he's not looking for people who are either or worshipers, either truth or spirit. He's looking for and worshipers, spirit and truth. Now, worship shouldn't just be focused on someone's imagination or someone's preferences. There's a, a concept in America that just basically says everyone should worship in their own way. That sounds great, and where I'll, what I will tell you is that's actually not in Scripture. It is in our culture, and we've often believed as though it is a spiritual truth. There's the emotional preference, and the emotional preference has to do with, with life, with expression. When it talks about spirit, it's not just talking about uh, being born into the kingdom of God. It actually is the word breath, and it has to do with the thing that animates us. Um, you, can, you can just, you can tell something is alive in part because it moves. If, if you drive down the road and, and there's an animal laying on the side of the road, you might think it's just taking a nap, but the likelihood is that it's going to be very still for a very long time. And that's not a good thing for that animal, right? So some favor expressive worship. Some, some people embrace emotion. It, it makes them feel good. They embrace expression. It makes them feel free. And you can prefer a song just because how it makes you feel. I mean, we've all got favorite songs, right? Uh, let's say, how many married people do we have in the room? Okay, that's good. How many married people do we have in the room that there's a song that's important to you as a couple? Yeah. And, uh, and it, there's something connected to the relationship. And so you might like listening to that song, or maybe you don't like listening to that song anymore, but <laughs> that song has meaning for you one way or the other. We might prefer a song just because of how it makes us feel. And, and there are people who just feel less inhibited when it comes to physical expression. 
Uh, they seem to not be self-conscious. Actually, what we find out is either or worshipers often are. It's the and worshipers that tend to lose self-consciousness and focus on God. But physically, uh, physical worshipers, physically expressive worshipers can be as self-conscious as, as someone who's a truth-oriented worshiper. Um, there's, uh, I'm a sucker for a certain kind of video that uh, uh, will show up on YouTube from time to time, and it is reunion videos. It is when people who've been separated for a while, maybe someone serving in the military, whatever the reason, they've been gone for a long time, and now they're able to get back together. And uh, it's fascinating to watch. What usually happens is a complete loss of self-consciousness. A person, so I've seen students going through a sporting event or maybe a dance recital or, or whatever it is that they're doing and, and they look up and they see the person that they've really missed. And in that moment, they forget what they're doing and they're not even aware anyone is watching. And they just run. Um, their facial expression, tears, laughter, running, squeezing tight for dear life, none of it is calculated. Not everyone responds the same way. Some just collapse in tears, others scream, some whisper really tender words in someone's ear. Everyone responds in some way. No one just ignores the person. They don't just look up and go, oh, it's you. That should tell us something. The challenge is that we want some, we might want some emotions of that experience even more than we want the person. We just like how something makes us feel. The goal is not just to have an experience, the goal is to experience God. And that's something to think about. Our emotions are very real, and they are a part of what we bring to our life and to our worship. They shouldn't be manipulated. We shouldn't hide them. A person's not less mature for having them. Now, worship preferences actually come with a set of temptations. There's some people in this room, you, you favor the more truth-oriented concept of worship. And some people in this room, you favor the more physically expressive concept of worship. And what I want you to know is whichever you favor, there's unique temptations to that. Both sides can be quite judgmental of the other side. A truth-oriented worshiper might say something like this. Oh, those emotional people. They're so ungrounded. They're so easily swayed. They don't care about truth. They will dance and wave their hands to anything if the beat is good and they like the melody. These, and, and, the, and the, the, um, the, emotion, or the, the more emotive and expressive worshipers, their temptation is to say something like this. These intellectual people are so dead and they're so disconnected. They don't care about life. As long as they hear what they agree with, they think they've checked all the boxes for God today. They don't just refuse to express their heart. I don't know if they even have a heart. And truth, preferenced worshipers want to be right and expressive worshipers want to feel good. Both those things are true. And God's not looking for either or worshipers. That's, that's not what he's searching for. There's lots of those. Not so many where it's spirit and truth. God is work, looking for worshipers who, they, while they love truth, they don't see it as a legal excuse to disengage. And expressive worshipers that don't see truth as an, or their uh, approach to worship as an excuse to not learn anything new. If it's all head and no heart, we can get kind of harsh. If it's all heart and no head, we can get pretty irresponsible. So we're not here just to feel good or just to know something. 
And, um, and, and a lot of people can feel kind of peer pressure when it comes to worship too, especially if you're on the, the, the truth preference side. Well, I'm not going to do it just because everyone's doing it. I'm not going to do it because they tell me. Um, the truth is, you might not be interested in doing it at all. So we have to think through this stuff. Um, whatever we're doing, uh, maybe, you, maybe you don't feel good today. It can happen. Um, will your emotion determine what you declare about God? Maybe you don't like peer pressure. That's fine. Will you allow your personal discomfort to determine what you declare about God? All of that is self-consciousness. Do you see it? It doesn't matter whether you're truth-oriented or expression-oriented. If we're either or, there's a lot of self-consciousness that breaks in. And God is looking for spirit and truth worshipers. Truth reveals, spirit animates. Now, I don't think anyone here would feel good about a sudden loss of intellectual capacity. I've known people that it's happened to. It's actually quite sad. And I don't know anyone here who would feel good about a sudden loss of physical capacity, in some way paralyzed. I've known people that that's happened to. I talked to a gentleman as part of our church family yesterday as a result of a stroke. He's still not walking. And uh, remarkably, he works really hard in physical therapy every day. And he's looking forward to the day. He told me, I'm looking forward to the day. I can walk in this space, worship with everyone again. Um, we would all see the loss of intellect or physical capacity as sad. And yet, sometimes that's what we're choosing when we seek our own preferences in worship. God is seeking you to worship him, not because he's insecure, not because he needs approval. It's because we're impoverished. Our mind is numb, our body is limited. And God has not come to impose himself on anyone. He's actually come to reveal himself to anyone and everyone, spirit and truth, knowledge and expression. So this particular woman kind of gives us a backstory of this. Uh, she came to get water at the well in a time of day when nobody else would be there. It's, it's, in, it's in the hottest part of the day. Everyone going to get water at wells goes early in the morning because it's a very physically demanding exercise. She's avoiding people. And you know what? People can, they can frustrate you. They can actually disappoint you. They can misunderstand you. And what we need to know is that God is not like the people who hurt you. Connecting with God might actually release the healing you need from the pain that you carry about the other connections you've had in your life. This woman was also thirsty. She's coming to the, to the well for water, which is a source of life. We don't live long without it. We can't live without water. She isn't just looking for better tasting water. She's looking for the source of life. And Jesus is that source. We, we come to God in worship because he's the source of life. It's not just a preference thing. Well, I like, no, no, the source of life. And this woman in the story had her heart broken either by death or divorce five times. And the person she was living with at that point, she was not married to. Don't allow those who broke your heart to keep you from the one who can heal your heart. That's what we do when we don't worship. We come to God, and he's looking for people who will lean into truth and are willing to declare. God is seeking worshipers who refuse to be limited by their personal preferences because that unlimits what he can do in their life. So I'm going to have the worship team come out. Uh, in case you're wondering, this is not a call for uh, truth-oriented people to go wild. Some of you just breathe a huge sigh of relief. It's not a call for expressive people to become bookish. It's a call to bring all of us to the one who withholds nothing from us. 
So we're going to have a closing song today, and in our closing song, we're going to try to put this into practice. I asked the worship team to, to pick out a song with some deep theological chops. There's truth in this song. And for, if, you, if you're a truth-oriented, you're going to see the words on the screen, and you're going to go, that's the best song they sang all day. Don't just see it. Sing it. Say it. Let your voice declare it. Something happens to you when your voice declares truth. Say, well, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I've got good news for you. This might be the best thing about wearing masks. No one will know you're singing. <laughs> just stand there and sing it out and no one will know. And then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand at some point. And maybe for a different reason. When, when I walk or drive into our neighborhood, whenever there's a car that I'm passing, I just, I raise my hand. Because they're neighbors. And the fact that they're out and about says a lot of good things. I just, I would, maybe while we're singing, you sense the presence of God in this place. Just raise your hand. Uh, sometimes, I asked you earlier, you know, something that you, if you were married and if you had a song and, and people raised their hand. When we're being asked to choose something, we often raise our hand. Uh, uh, how many would like cake? How many would like ice cream? See, and we all raise our hands. How many would like cake and ice cream? Why choose if you don't have to, you know? But yes. And then... Sometimes we raise our hands when we're making a promise. If you've ever been or seen a courtroom, there comes a moment when they'll ask someone who's about to give testimony, would you please raise your hand? And do you promise that what you're going to say is truthful now? And maybe while we're singing this song, you might sense God's presence and you raise your hand or you might hear something that's true and you're acknowledging, I think that's true. Or maybe I wish that would become true in my life. Or maybe while you're thinking of that song, an option, a promise comes to your mind and, and you raise your hand and you say, I want to make that commitment to God. There's one other way to raise your hand. It looks a little bit different, this one, because this is hello and this is, this is what I, I, I think is right. And, and this is, I'm making a promise. And this is, I need something today. And I think God has something to give me. So let's all put our masks on and let's all stand up. And I'm going to ask you, spirit and truth, lean into the truth. Animate something of your physical being. God is looking for people who will do this today.